Selmer soloist mouthpieces are some of the most misunderstood mouthpieces, and it's essential to understand their development, um, especially with how it relates to saxophone necks and neck designs of SBA Mark VI, etc., uh, that is so important in how the instrument has uh, evolved. This is a very rare example. Um, uh, it's a short shank alto mouthpiece. It says solo with C star. It is all original. The baffle is really, really well done. But what makes this so unique is the inside. Now, I know what you're thinking. Soloist has a horseshoe shape. This does not. That is a very unique shape. You can see how it was a solo, uh, it was a horseshoe, but then it has been modified. If I look there at the baffle, you see just how, how cool the baffle is, but you see how that finishes almost all the way into the chamber. And the modern soloists uh, do not, not even the modern soloists, uh, by the time you get to like 1960, they do not. Um, one thing that I hear from a lot of uh, tenor players, for example, that are playing these, trying to get the Henderson sound or Henderson approach, uh, is the intonation on these is, is sketchy. And the long shank, the early long shank soloists, like Kenny Garrett, uh, is a lot more in tune. Well, here is why this is so interesting. Um, I believe this mouthpiece would have been paired with an early SBA alto. What a lot of people don't know is early SBA altos have bigger bore necks. Um, there's so much variation to, to the neck design of SBAs. I think more even than Mark VI. Over the 20 years of a Mark VI, how many uh, neck designs? Well, there were more in the six years or so um, that they made, uh, or seven years that they made an SBA. Um, uh, so... Um, so what happens is, is this actually looks like a Selmer airflow. Now, I know there are many different types of airflow. There are the airflows with the gold rings. There are the airflows that have this type of design, but this is shorter and the blank is fatter. Uh, some say table, written this way, table, B star, table, C, whatever. And then there's the oval series, and sometimes the oval is this way, sometimes the oval is this way. Um, I believe the Oval series came with the early SBAs, and they have this type of interior, very similar to it at least. Um, perhaps actually a little smaller, and that's important because the necks on uh, early SBAs have a smaller bore, much like a BA, um, when compared with uh, the later SBAs. So, and then once the sixth neck came around, especially after the super early ones. The bore got a little smaller, and guess what? They stopped finishing that design. It became the horseshoe shape. Now, where this is so interesting is, as the Mark VII came out and the S80 C-Star with the square chamber came out, that forever changed neck design. Because um, ever since then, how popular that mouthpiece has been, all necks have to be designed in part to make that tune. The interesting thing is, if you play an SBA, especially a late SBA, with a square chamber uh, S80, you're going to encounter some tuning difficulty. Same thing with any vintage mouthpiece, because they weren't designed with square chambers in mind. Um, a modern Series 2, a uh, Super Action 80 Series 2, yeah, sure, that'll tune with a square chamber. But an old SBA, BA, Mark VI, no, you're going to encounter a lot of difficulty. I'm not saying it can't be done. But there's something that's lost um, from the neck design. Um, I, as a clarinet player, I like to have a bit more free-blowing nature because I, I have to use air when I'm playing clarinet. I have to project. And with this kind of interior, that's closer to what I like. I find I can use more air, more volume of air uh, with this, and, and it just creates a freer sensation. And I still find focus in part from the baffle. That baffle is more intricate than anything you'll find on an S80. 
and in part that is where the focus comes from. You can also look at an early um, Meyer Bros with totally open interior, just round like a modern Meyer, but they achieve the focus entirely with the baffle. But that's hard to do. It's easier to just tighten up the interior, and there you go, there's focus. But that's, again, that's easy. That's a shortcut. Um, so this mouthpiece represents a transition, a transition from uh, more open, more hollow in a way sounding horns to tighter, more nasally sounding mouthpieces. Um, and you do find uh, soloist short shanks in, in closer tip openings. They can be common, but not necessarily with that kind of uh, throat shape. And the most interesting thing is it's actually, it's a spectrum. Sometimes you see it and it's less finished than this, but still there's some handwork. And then you see late soloists and there's no uh, uh, hand finishing at all. It's just a like a modern Selmer soloist horseshoe shape. Um, and so people are, again, something like this, you need to match it with a slightly bigger bore neck, in my opinion. These are a little warmer sounding because that that chamber opens up the sound a little bit. It's a little freer. Uh, the later, you know, kind of Kenny Garrett kind of sound, more, har more harsh, more uh, French focus, that comes from a tighter, more angular edges on the inside of the mouthpiece. So... Uh, at the end of the day, you have to make sure that your, your mouthpiece agrees with your neck. Um, and um, so often people choose a horn based off the mouthpiece they're comfortable with, say an S80, and, they and they're and they trying a bunch of mouthpiece uh, horns, Yamaha, Selmer, whatever, finding what, what tunes best on, an, on, a, on their mouthpiece, their C-Star, rather than thinking, hmm, this has to be a synergy. The mouthpiece has to agree with the horn. And is the chamber really right for me? For the type of music I want to play? For my niche in the music world? Uh, this mouthpiece is the clearest crossroads of the vintage sound into the modern sound.